All right. Good morning, Doug. We're, we're about a week away from the U.S. election, so I'd like your thoughts on what we can expect going into that. Also, I'd like to cover the Brazil election, hear what you got to say. And I noticed a troubling uh, trend around the world where the U.S. is engaging in a number of military exercises. So I wanted to cover that as well. But before we get into those issues, I wanted to interrupt this video to take something that Doug and I talked about at the very end and move it to the beginning. We want to make sure more people hear it because it involves an opportunity and could be just right for you. So here it is. And after this, we'll get back to the normal video. You got to ask yourself, well, why exactly? And why did Angela Merkel invite a million aliens into Germany who basically were then, and I think still are, just welfare recipients. Yeah, so it's it kind of it kind of seems like what's happening here in the U.S. as well, frankly. Yeah, it, it it really does. I mean, what are two or three million completely penniless people of a different culture and different language? What are they bringing to the party? I mean, other than somebody to run your leaf blower on a, on a Saturday. I mean, and is it true that they're all getting cell phones and they're being put up in hotels? I mean, where are they staying, those two or three million people? I mean, physically, where are they being put up and who's feeding them? Because they don't have any money. So what's going on here and why? Right. And yet still the, uh, you know, the unemployment rate is really low. So it's not like these people are adding to the labor pool in any obvious way, right? Or else we would see it. We'd see it in the numbers, wouldn't we? Where are investigative reporters when we need them? There aren't any. If you can't Google it, Doug, it's not worth reporting on. I think that's the new rule for reporters. Yeah, it absolutely is. All the reporting comes from Google. And where the stuff comes from that's on Google is kind of a black box in many ways. <laughs> All right, the context is in place. Here is the opportunity. Let us know what you think. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm tempted. I mean, not personally tempted because I've actually got other things to do. I'm not a reporter, but it makes me feel like I'd like to go down to the border and find these people. And then what do they do? Uh, yeah, just follow follow a couple of guys. And just see, follow their journey to where they end up and where they start working and how they're living. Yeah, All yeah. Vermont. I think it'd be interesting, but I, I haven't seen anything or heard, have you heard, seen or heard anything like that? No, never, never heard anything like that. Huh. And I, I mean, they probably wouldn't, you know, there'd be a few places because obviously when they take them into custody, so then, you know, you wouldn't, you'd have to be able to meet up with them after they come out of custody and they probably get bust or shipped somewhere else. So you'd have to, you'd have to kind of make a deal with some people before you meet them, you know, where they, they, if they, let you know where they're at. You pay them, you know, some amount of money um, to follow the Taylor story. But I mean, I'd, I'd be worth it'd be worth crowdfunding somebody who could do that. Would go and meet with some migrants coming across the border, and make a deal with them, you know. Like, let, I just want to tell your story and totally anonymously, you know, about where you go, what happens, and uh, and I'll, and offer a big enough of a reward financially for them that they will, you know, as soon as they get out of custody, they call you. Yeah, exactly. We need a Spanish speaker. Definitely, yep. Uh, that would be important. But uh, God, I wish somebody would would uh, grab that bull by the horns. It's a great opportunity for you know some guy just out of college that uh, wants to make a name for himself as a, a new Seymour Horsch, uh, who's you know, or Glenn Greenwald. Somebody like yeah, if, someone, if someone's interested, let us know because uh, because um, we'll talk about it. Because I I I mean I'd be, I'd be I'd support financing that effort just to see what happens. I would too, and it wouldn't it would take a lot of money. What we need is a a young guy should be a guy I think uh, who speaks Spanish who wants to tag a, along with some of these people for and see what yeah, happens. You got to be, uh, you got to be good with people. You got to be a good communicator. You got to be completely flexible. 
you know, where you can basically set aside whatever you have planned for a month or six weeks or whatever, and do this only um, to get to the bottom of it. But, but yeah, you don't, young, smart, motivated Spanish speaker who can communicate well would be the right guy. Rare opportunity to become famous and rich, God knows what, because yeah. nobody's doing it in this country, which, which, which is shocking in itself. Nobody's thought of doing that. Well, we're thinking of it, and we, we, we'd like to put our kind of our money where our mouth is if that person presents himself. Yep. All right. Well, I'll be watching in the comments. You can also get me on the Telegram channel. Where would you like to start? Well, all interesting topics. Um, here in the hinterlands where I am, uh, it would seem that there's going to be a a red wave, a red tide that's going to sweep over the U.S. and uh, uh, but but then again, I was listening to MSNBC Morning Joe, and it sounds like it might be a a close called thing. I have no, I have really no idea because, as I said in 2020 and for that matter 2016, it's a question of who's going to cheat best. I mean, this is a, a major, major thing. Uh, and of course, one of the memes that that uh, the Democrats in particular are promoting is that it's un-American to even talk about or think about anybody cheating. That just doesn't happen in American politics. Not only in American, I think it's criminal at this point, or at least they're trying to suggest that it is uh, aligned with criminal thinking and behavior. Yes, well, of course, the nature of politics is criminality, and the worst kind of people are the only people that go into politics. I mean, perhaps there are a few exceptions, a few anomalies out there, but these people that get into politics are absolutely horrible. And the thing that I saw from MSNBC indicated that that uh, brain, brain damaged person, and of course, I hate to sound, you know, cold and uncaring. It's too bad if anybody has a stroke and are brain damaged. That's tough. Uh, but people that have significant mental disabilities shouldn't be running for office. But they're zeroing in on that as opposed to the fact that this guy is a raving lunatic leftist. Nobody even mentions that anymore. It's anyway. Yeah, I don't think that's enough. I don't. I don't think he'll lose the election under the the idea that he is a raving leftist. I don't think that. No, that's no, that's irrelevant. Good. So, so do you think he's going to win or not? The the rightists say that he's going to lose, and the lefties say he's going to win. Do you have a personal view on that for any reason? I I, you know, the only thing I know is that in the uh, twenty twenty elections there was a lot of alleged shenanigans happening in Pennsylvania. And so if that if that's true, then you know, then it would imply that that potentially the the infrastructure is there to do it again. So which should which I think would give him the victory. I mean if he wins, actually it shows either the American people are far dumber than even we thought because you know electing somebody who's clearly uh, impaired. So either dumber or the system is more corrupt. Than we thought. So I, I think there's no way in any reasonable world that he would win. Not to say I don't, Dr. Oz, I don't like him at all. I think he's a terrible yeah. candidate. Why the Republicans pick yeah. people like him. Yeah, you're right. God, you get to you get to choose between dumb and dumber. You get Tweedledee or Tweedledum. This is this is <laughs> this is absolutely shameful. I mean, and people pay attention to this. Well. The problem, of course, is this, is that the society is now oriented around the state and around government. Instead of being a, a, a minor nuisance, uh, everything goes into and out of the state. And so it's, it's important. And that trend is clearly in motion. Everybody thinks that that's the way it should be. It's cause for genuine pessimism. It is. I agree. But so you think, uh, is your your is your prediction at this point that the uh, Republicans will take control in the House 
or Senate or both? What do you think right. on that now? All, all I know is what I read in the papers, and, and that's a fact of the matter. And MSNBC. <laughs> and MSNBC, and, and Fox, of course, yeah. uh, those two. But it's mighty amusing. It, it, was, it was so amusing. I don't know how many of our listeners uh, or viewers actually tune into MSNBC, uh, but I uh, called it up on YouTube and uh, went to Morning Joe, and I was... I was flabbergasted, frankly, at, uh, you know, I, I hate Democrats, I hate Republicans for different reasons, but I've got to say, the raw hate that was being spewed by these people, it was actually quite shocking. I mean, they really, they really hate Republicans or conservatives or Anybody no, that's not a, a rabid Democrat. Yep. So it is shocking. And I actually, I really, people should watch the other side just to see it because, because uh, I find it very difficult to watch, honestly, uh, because I, because I, it, it gives me, it makes me feel, I mean, the, the, the things that people are saying seem so clearly lies, just like I can't watch Sean Hannity, actually. Same. No, reason. I can't watch him. I feel like he's just, just a propagandist. You know, I can't, so I can't stand it. The intellectual dishonesty is so great. But on MSNBC, it's like that plus another level of just uh, disgust that they have for their opponents. That's there. It's just it's uh, it's difficult to listen to. Yeah, it really is. You're quite correct about Sean Hannity, and the same can be said about Jesse Waters. Although uh, the good thing about Jesse is he used to I used to like his man in the street things where mm -hmm. he used to come up to an average citizen and ask him an incredibly stupid question and get an even more stupid answer. So now it's, it's it, 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 but it, it, it's quite amazing that uh, listening to these, these people and you can tell that they're sincere, they're rabid and hateful in their hearts, much worse than Hannity even. I mean, yeah. because at least there's some common sense uh, full of hypocrisy, true. But there's some common sense in basic conservative values. It's not the case with these progressive wokesters. No, it's yeah, it's out of control. It's, but I, really, people should watch because you gotta. Un, I think you should try and understand the way you're being viewed by a whole large swath of the population. And when, you, when as you know, the if the tide turns more and more against Republicans and conservatives, for instance, you'll know why. I mean, you, you know why that, you know, you under, you'll understand the motivations because these people actually are being positioned as really evil but, and really dangerous. Yes. And it puts the uh, fact that one poll, of course, not that I trust polls, but one poll said that uh, half of the Democrats thought that people that spoke out against the vaccine or didn't take the vaccine or they should be put in concentration camps you you've seen this where yes it's half of half of the people that vote democrats want to lock up people that aren't vaxxed i mean this is did you see this this uh, atlantic article calling for an amnesty relating to uh, people's behavior around the pandemic i saw that exactly like this was like this is a uh this is a, an amnesty like what was going on what is what happened in Rwanda 20 years ago that type of thing you need an amnesty for that type of thing yeah i actually no these people and and, and the, there's lots of proof of this the fact that they actively promote serious psychological aberrations like uh transgenderism for children and there's so much more these people are actually mentally unbalanced. Now it's worse than mentally unbalanced. They're actually loony crazy. I mean, they're not people that I would want to even have as a next door neighbor because they might do something insane. Because, well, here, here I am talking this way. I'm talking exactly the way these people talk about us. This is the kind of stuff that goes on before a civil war occurs. Yeah, uh, you're right. You're right. But I mean, but I think it's it's the interesting thing about this Atlantic article to me was that 
there's clearly some recognition on the part of at least some of the left at this point that they went too far with all of it. That like demanding people lose their jobs, demanding that they be, you know, demanding they not attend the, the funerals of their relatives, that churches be closed, all that stuff, that maybe it went a little too far. And there, and the, some of the wiser ones maybe on the on the front end of that can see the danger to themselves, you know. And so they want to try to get it's like trying to get out there in advance saying, hey, you know, you know, uh, you know, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Don't you remember? Yeah, but the very fact that the whole country was locked down and closed down, whether you believed it or not, the streets were empty, the stores were empty. And this happened all over the world. It was a genuine worldwide hysteria that uh, I'm not sure people really even like to talk about it at this point because it was so embarrassing and, and actually terrifying, but it happened. It happened. And, but the, a lot of the responses I saw to this on Twitter were like, oh, no, 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 fuck you. Well, there is not going to be an amnesty. They like, you know, people are saying there should be, uh, you know, there should be uh, uh, Nuremberg trials and hangings. Like yes. that's the other side. That's the way they feel about it now, which. Yeah, well, I think both sides feel that way. And those feelings aren't going to go away easily. In fact, <clears throat> they're being accelerated on different fronts because you pointed out earlier we were talking before we went on the air about different military maneuvers that uh, the U.S. government is taking yeah, part in around the world. What, what are they? Can you list them? Yeah, let me share my screen here. So all these have happened within the last, all within the last few weeks, if not happening right now. So you can see that uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, announced that they were, you know, high alert after a warning of imminent attack from Iran. Uh, there's some U.S. and South Korean military exercises, which the North Korea finds very antagonizing. You know, as a let's, their... let's let's stop with the Saudi Arabia thing because for uh, you know for for many many decades, Saudi Arabia was basically uh, America's bitch, right. but uh, the current crown prince uh, has a mind of its own and is actually what. Who's he talking to? The Russians and God knows who else. And he's not talking to the Americans, who I suspect he sees the Americans as um, as the biggest danger and risk for him to invade the kingdom and take his oil. After all, it was us that said, hey, what's our oil doing under their sand? You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But it's interesting that, you know, they're the, I think the one reason that Saudi uh, tries to maintain relations with the U S as kind of is to help defend against Iran. And so it seems like, um, I mean, there's, there's just a lot of military activity happening all over. And I was, and I, I don't know if this is real from Saudi Arabia's standpoint, if they're doing it to try and get the U S to be, you know, to maybe give them excuse to, engage with the U.S. after that OPEC thing that was so bad that, uh, you know, the big slap in the face that uh, that uh, Biden got from that. So I don't know, but it's it's interesting for sure. The Middle East could just boil over at any moment. It's been that way forever, but it feels like tensions are higher now than they've been in a long time. Yeah, it could. So clearly Saudi Arabia and Anvarans are uh, an area that uh, could wind up receiving some 101st Airborne Therapy at some point in the future. Except for the 101st Airborne is just happens to be tied up in Romania right now. Well, they're busy right now. So maybe the 82nd Airborne. The second half to step in. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, this is another example of another place where we've got uh, American troops. Uh, but so one of the biggest ones, right? I feel like the, the, the North Korea one is very risky because um, you know, at least the way that uh, that uh, that the Kim Jong Un, I believe his name is, is uh, positioned, is that he's, you know, isolated and a little insane, and you know, can get kind of squirrely. So running a bunch of military exercises right on next to their territory just seems like it's so crazy prov provocative, and I don't, it could easily blow over into much much more. 
it's like asking for trouble, especially since it seems to be a genuine fact that he's having a set off what one or two or three uh, nuclear weapons. So three. he's probably got four or five or six more mm -hmm. that could be deployed. So, so why poke that bear? What's the point? It's not our problem. It's the problem of the South Koreans. It is. It is. And yeah, of course, it doesn't end there. You know, I mean, the other thing is uh, India is planning military drills you know, near China's border with the U.S. and other countries, not just not just the U.S., but India is also, you know, mobilizing their military. It's almost like people are preparing for another global war. I mean, I just don't remember this much military activity happening all at once everywhere. Yes, and 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 it, it's good to remember that the Chinese and the Indians have had very serious border wars at least three or four times uh, in the last fifty years. So it's not like they're good buddies or friends, although uh, they both want to uh, get rid of the dollar and perhaps, you know, do something monetarily on the same page. But but why is the why are the Americans right now uh, encouraging the Indians to do something to provoke the Chinese on their border? Well, maybe they're thinking maybe that'll distract them from uh, attacking Taiwan. But once again, none of our business, none of our business, if the Chinese and the Indians want to have a nuclear war with each other, that would be a real pity. But we don't have to make it a three-way nuclear war. No, and one, one of the things, this India, the India situation is like the Saudi Arabia situation in a way, in that both of them recently rejected the the desires of the U.S. in terms of the way that they've been handling Russia, and uh, you know, India is you know still trading with them, still buying their gas, not going to participate in the sanctions. If anything, they're basically giving them a, a way to get their uh, oil and gas shipped out around the world, you know, by going through India. So there's kind of we've parted ways with India recently on that, and obviously with Saudi Arabia with in relation to the OPEC decision. And I wonder if maybe the military, because the deepest ties probably still are in the militaries, um, if that might be a way to try and reinforce the relationships between, you know, keep them more in our court. Yeah, well, oh. how much good does it do <clears throat> to have a uh, so-called friendly military? Because when things turn around, it can very become, very easily become an unfriendly military. Oh, wait a minute. I thought the Afghan army we're, we're like our ally in that part of the world. And now it turns out that they're not our ally after all. And Sweet. I thought for a long time, uh, Saddam Hussein was our ally against the Iranians. He was our pretty good, good buddy. Yeah, pretty good, our good buddy. And, and then that, that all kind of came to an end. So, you know, having a military alliance uh, really doesn't, help anything at all yep and another one we see is that you know and i think this is all trying to counter china i suppose but you know japan the u.s and large-scale military exercises you know, these these wrapped up um a couple of weeks ago but it was a big one considered very provocative by china also russia so once well again, and it is provocative because uh it's not i guess it's not so much in the news now but uh there are lots of islands on offshore China that are, some are claimed by Indonesia, others by the Philippines, others by the Japanese, others by, others by the Taiwanese. And did I mention the Indonesians? I'm any, Anyway, all of these countries there have claims to that South China Sea, East China Sea area. Uh, well, that's a good opportunity for us to get involved in that and take sides. And, you know, any, people forget that uh, uh, Japan is, is not China. People forget that during World War II, which wasn't all that long ago, I mean, there are still people around that were during, that are still alive, that the uh, Japanese basically committed mass murder 
against the Chinese, and we're treating them like Untermenschen. And the Chinese, you know, don't appreciate that. They have kind of a, if you would, a racial memory of hatred between those Japanese across the sea. It's a deep-seated and uh, visceral hate for them. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it runs real, real deep among Chinese. It really does. And uh, you can read about the rape of Nanking. Um, I mean, some, some of the different experiments that the Japanese were running made it stuff the Nazis were doing looked like child's play. Honestly, it's pretty outrageously awful. Yeah, so it, it really makes a lot of sense. It's really smart on the part of the U.S. government to uh, kind of stoke the fires uh, in Japan. You know, I'm sure the Chinese appreciate that too. I know, it's so funny. So World War II, China was our ally. I know people don't can't imagine that, but uh, they were. China was our ally in World War II. Yes, they were. And, and then, of course, we got involved in the post-World War II civil we war. Sides. We picked sides. We should have just stayed away. Exactly. You know, it's just like Thomas Jefferson said. Uh, trade with all, a friend to all, uh, ally with none. Yep. Anyway, so something might happen there. So we're, we're, of we're, course, uh, oh, the Pacific, you got the Philippines too? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. And here's another thing. Should, you know, it, it said that the, I, I'm a big fan of the Philippines. I, I like it as a place to hang out. But, uh, People forget that the Philippines is not like a real country. You've got the North, which is basically Christian, and you've got the South, which is basically Muslim. Uh, Mindanao, for instance, and, and all the islands down there, which are really more part of uh, Indonesia than anything else. But they're part of the Philippines because when the US conquered it, conquered the Philippines from Spain 120 years ago. Uh, it all got thrown together. And to this day, I mean, I'm having been to uh, the Southern Philippines and Mindanao, it's actually scary. You can look at some of these people and they see you as a, a tall American and you can tell they had no reason to hate me but you could tell that they hated all of us because we were the foreign conquerors. Why? Because it turned out that after we took it over from the Spaniards, we killed about 200,000, numbers vary. Uh, Men, uh, women, and children. Yeah, it just, you know, it, it was really mass murder on our part. In, and it was in the Southern Philippines, the Muslim areas, which, uh, shouldn't be part of the Philippines to this day. So what are we doing there? I mean, this is... It's amazing. I just It's just one thing after another. And this is why, like, there's having so much of this happen in so many places all around the world. I don't know. It just, you just, like, it's very easy to imagine something goes wrong, some mistake is made, and things flare up for real. Because, you know, the one of the things that, like, the North Korea was saying, is that when these drills that they're doing, in South Koreans and the Americans, they look like they're going to be attacked. That's what it looks like. If you're following the military maneuvers, you see what's happening. It's like, are they actually launching an attack on us? And so they're on edge waiting to see if that's actually what's happening. You know, and then they and then they do these things, and it's so, it seems so dumb to me where they say, uh, you know, we fired three rockets, you know, uh, as a show of force, you know, across the border. It's like what kind of show of force is this? Does this actually work? You fired some rockets and that's actually now, I was like, oh, these guys do mean business now. You know, it's just, it's just, it's just unnecessarily provocative and very risky because it can spiral out of control. Accidents get made, mistakes get made. They do. And if I was a, a paranoid uh, North Korean general or dictator and realized that the South Koreans and the Americans were having major ex military exercises Every so often you'd say, hmm, is this one not just a head fake? Is this the real one? Or why are they doing this at all? Are, are, are they keeping a sharp point on the spear for when they are going to do it? I mean, it's it, it's all kind of nuts. It is. It is. I saw this one stuck out kind of interesting to me, too. And this is that 
you know, this major uh, army exercise happening in uh, Hawaii, we're basically doing this island hopping, um, you know, taking, basically taking over, uh, doing island island landings, essentially. Um, the U.S. Army is there. So in preparing for, as they say, it's designed to replicate a fight with China, they say. That's what it says. Interestingly, uh, in that picture there, uh, it looks like I know. we've got a couple of soldiers doing the uh, the Maori haka. That's kind of yeah. what it looks like they're doing with the tongue sticking out and the rest. Uh, maybe they've got some New Zealand troops roped into that. Maybe as well. That could be. Yeah, that could be. It, yeah. it is a haka, I'm sure, with the tongue sticking out and the and and, and the rest of it. So. Yeah, that must be what it is. Yeah. That must be. Okay. But anyway, yeah, it's so, yeah. anyway. That's yeah. So so we're we're doing an island hopping, uh, an island hopping exercise directed at China. So. Yep. Sure. That. that this is all. This is all like in the current news, like within the last few days, couple of weeks. Exactly. This is all, every, none of this is older than two weeks. None of these ones I'm showing you. And I, this is not an exhaustive list. I didn't, I just, I just was trying to collect a sample of it. Now, a lot of these do happen to be focused around Asia. There's the Saudi one that's in the Middle East. And then other than that, you know, the, we are, we know what's already happening in Russia, Ukraine, but I don't know if enough people really understand what's happening in Romania in particular, and that people in Romania, I got a, a friend of mine was telling me about, uh, you know, a friend of his who's there and was, they were getting pretty nervous about all the, the staging being set up for NATO forces there. And especially the 101st airborne who's now there, you know, it could, they could end up being the staging area. I mean, it looks, it looks like if anything happens where they end up going into Ukraine, they're going to be doing it from Romania, which obviously opens Romania up. Yeah, why would the French and Spanish armies and air forces be gathering in Romania at this point? So, show of force. <laughs> just, just, just amazing. Just amazing. Well, one thing is for sure: if I ran this, if I was the prime minister of Spain, uh, those soldiers would withdraw like tomorrow morning. Absolutely. Yeah, no question about it. And I just don't, it just does seem like the, you know, it's been a strong forward momentum for escalation only is the only policy directive with regard to Ukraine. And it does not seem to me that that's been, uh, been, they've been letting off of that position at all. I mean, a lot of the, it's not in the news as much. It's kind of taken, you know, it's kind of fallen by the wayside. But if you follow troop movements, which I think is a great way to understand what's actually going to happen. I mean, this is how it was obvious that, that Russia was going to invade Ukraine was because of troop movements. Then you look at it now and you go, escalation is the plan. It's like they're, you know, it's, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if they sent the 101st in to, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to basically block Russia from going into Odessa. And then, you know, and then, and then with U.S. troops then stationed there so that, you know, just as a preventative thing, not, not attack Russians, right? But then setting it up so there's more likely future conflict. But that's the kind of stuff the 101st would do. It's like go in and secure that area, just secure it, protect it, you know, and then but basically get a big target painted on them and a huge cause for escalation later. It's amazing how a, a border war in an area that's had constant border wars for the last thousand years, border war between two shithole countries can keep building momentum the way it is. I mean, when's it going to reverse course and go the other direction? Or is it? Well, maybe one of the reasons why, Doug, is because the first start, stuff we started talking about where the tensions that are oriented toward a civil war can continue to grow here. Like the, you know, the resentment of, of the two sides, the hatred really of the two sides continues to grow. And you know maybe only by redirecting that energy externally might there be a chance of uh, you know avoiding any kind of real conflict here. And people, you know, people don't um, think about the fact that yes, the uh, 
the Ukraine used to be part of the Soviet Union, but they forget that apart from the fact that it was never a country before, before Lenin designated it as a Soviet Socialist Republic, and then uh, Stalin, uh, perpetrated what's known as the Hollandor on the Ukrainians, where millions of Ukrainians were starved to death. And the Ukrainians are not friends of the Russians. And when one of the big mistakes that uh, Hitler made when he invaded uh, the Soviet Union was not clasping the U Ukrainians to, and the Belarusians for that matter, to his bosom and arming them and instead idiotically, I mean, he did so many idiotic things, of course, but one of them was instead of, you know, welcoming them as um, they wanted to fight the Russians, the Soviets. And he made the Ukrainians into enemies during World War II. Instead of, so it was, I mean, these people have, have not had good relations for like, a long, long time. One of the things that I wasn't as aware of, I guess, is the, is the, is kind of the the attitude that Poland has and people have about Poland in that re, in the region. Like, as I, I've known a lot of Polish people, I like them very much, but it, I'm surprised that how antagonist, how much of an antagonist they really are, and everything that's been going on in Ukraine right now. And you know, recently, then they came out and they were demanding war reparations from Germany. <laughs> did you see that? That's, yes, I did. That's 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 really funny. What are the chances of that happening? And there's something else too. You know, strange things. We were talking with uh, a couple of our German friends the other day, and one of them pointed out, you know, the acquisition of the merger of Chrysler and Daimler Benz, which took place 20, 25 years ago. When that happened, I said, this makes no sense at all to me. I mean, Chrysler uh, had just risen from its deathbed. They made shitty cars. They were notoriously badly managed, would have gone bankrupt if they hadn't acquired Jeep. And how is it that they merged with Daimler Mercedes? Yeah. How did that happen? That, that was well, one thing. And another thing, the, that they brought up, which at the same time, I didn't look into it, but I said, this is really stupid. How stupid is the manager, a bear, buyer, that uh, at the very time when the uh, big scandal about glyphosate or Roundup was going on and suits were being filed, buyer uh, buys Monsanto and immediately puts itself in line to pay, what was it, $25 billion? which back in those days was real money. <laughs> uh, you know, why did they feel a necessity to buy a company that should have gone bankrupt? Right. And I mean, our, well, our German friends, I think that their, their idea is that there was, that there's, they believe that there's an intentional effort to weaken and deindustrialize and to, uh, to remove assets essentially from Germany. So they, that's, that's their thinking around it. They know a lot more about that than I do, but that's their opinion. Yeah, you got to ask yourself, well, why exactly? And why did Angela Merkel invite a million aliens into Germany who basically were then, and I think still are, just welfare recipients? Yeah. So it's it kind of it kind of seems like what's happening here in the U.S. as well, frankly. Yeah, it, it it really does. I mean, what are two or three million completely penniless people of a different culture and different language? What are they bringing to the party? I mean, other than somebody to run your leaf blower on a on a Saturday. I mean, and. Is it true that they're all getting cell phones and they're being put up in hotels? I mean, where are they staying, those two or three million people? I mean, physically, where are they being put up? 
and who's feeding them because they don't have any money. So what's going on here and why? Right. And yet still the, uh, you know, the unemployment rate is really low. So it's not like these people are adding to the labor pool in any obvious way. Right. Or else we would see it. We'd see it in the numbers, wouldn't we? Where are investigative reporters when we need them? There aren't any. If you can't Google it, Doug, it's not worth reporting on. I think that's the new rule for reporters. Yeah, it absolutely is. All the reporting comes from Google. And where the stuff comes from that's on Google is kind of a black box in many ways. I mean, I, I'm tempted. I mean, not personally tempted because I've actually got other things to do. I'm not a reporter, but it makes me feel like I'd like to go down to the border and find these people. And then what do they do? Uh, yeah, just follow follow a couple of guys and just see, follow their journey to where they end up and where they start working and how they're living. Yeah, all yeah. Them I think it'd be interesting, but I, I haven't seen anything or have you heard, seen or heard anything like that? No, never, never heard anything like that. Hmm. And I, I mean, they probably wouldn't, you know, there'd be a few places because obviously when they take them into custody, so then, you know, you wouldn't, you'd have to be able to meet up with them after they come out of custody and they probably get bussed or shipped somewhere else. So you'd have to, you'd have to kind of make a deal with some people before you meet them, you know, where they, they, if they let you know where they're at, you pay them, you know, some amount of money um, to follow the Taylor story. But I mean, I, I'd be worth, it'd be worth crowdfunding somebody who could do that, who would go and meet with some migrants coming across the border and make a deal with them. You know, like, let, I just want to tell your story and totally anonymously, you know, about where you go, what happens, and uh, and, I'll, and offer a big enough of a reward financially for them that they will, you know, as soon as they get out of custody, they call you. Yeah, exactly. We need a Spanish speaker. Definitely, yep. Uh, that would be important. But uh, God, I wish somebody would would uh, grab that bull by the horns. It's a great opportunity for you know some guy just out of college that. Uh, wants to make a name for himself as a, a new Seymour Horsch, uh, who's, you know, it, or Glenn Greenwald, somebody like yeah, that. If, someone, if, if someone's interested, let us know, because, uh, because um, we'll talk about it. Because I, I, I mean, I'd be, I'd be, I'd support financing that effort just to see what happens. I would too. And it wouldn't it would take a lot of money. What we need is a, a young guy, it should be a guy, I think, uh, who speaks Spanish, who wants to tag a, along with some of these people for and see what you gotta happens. Be, you got to be uh, you got to be good with people. You got to be a good communicator. You got to be completely flexible, you know, where you can basically set aside whatever you have planned for a month or six weeks or whatever, and do this only um, to get to the bottom of it. But, but yeah, you don't young, smart, motivated Spanish speaker who can communicate well, would be the right guy. Rare opportunity to become famous and rich, God knows what, because yeah. nobody's doing it in this country, which, which, which is shocking in itself. Nobody's thought of doing that. Well, we're thinking of it, and we, we, we'd like to put our kind of our money where our mouth is if that person presents himself. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll be watching the comments. You can also get me on the Telegram channel. Um, okay. Well, I think on that, Doug, we'll wrap it up here and we'll uh, be back on Friday. So thank you very yeah, much. That's an exciting prospect, Matt. It'll be fun. Yeah, cool.